J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Mr. and Mrs. America. <laughs> You know, one of our grandest American institutions is the good old-time parade. And starting next Thursday, April 6th, the Parade of Progress will go marching along all over this country. It's sponsored by the Associated Grocery Manufacturers of America, and Jell-O is proud to join. Because Jell-O's whole existence has been a parade of progress for the 40-odd years it's been on the market. And through the years, there have been constant new developments and improvements. Jell-O's delicious flavor has been made extra rich, and new flavors have been introduced. Jell-O is quicker and easier to make nowadays, for it dissolves instantly in hot water and sets far more quickly. And with all the improvements, Jell-O costs less. Today, you pay half as much for it as you would have 20 years ago. Yes, without boasting, we can truthfully say that Jell-O has kept right on the bandwagon in the great parade of progress. So Jell-O salutes the grocers of America and is proud to march along with them. And for our float in the big parade, we suggest the box with the big red letters on it that spell Jell-O. America played by the orchestra. Now, folks, do you all know last Wednesday night, Clark Gable and Carol Lombard eloped to Kingman, Arizona, and were married. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you the man who held the ladder, Jack Benny. <laughs> Yes, sir. Hello again. This is Cupid's assistant talking. <laughs> and, Don, I don't know where you got that information about my helping Clark and Carol. But you're right, and I was never so embarrassed in my life. There I was holding the ladder, all dressed up in a tuxedo like a big goof. <laughs> <laughs> tuxedo, what was the big idea? Well, it's very silly, really. You see, Carol called up and asked me to hurry over because she was going to run away and get married. Yes? Well, I got so darn excited, I thought she meant to me. <laughs> <laughs> God, when I saw Gable there, I almost fainted. Oh, well, that must have been quite a letdown for you, huh, Jack? Well, it was, but they were awfully nice about it, though. They let me keep the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to grow ivy on it, you know? <laughs> well, Jack, now, what in the world made you think that Miss uh, Lombard would elope with you anyway? Oh, I don't know, Don. She's always so nice when we meet on the street. And then one time, during a dust storm, she winked at me. <laughs> <laughs> So, what was I to think? Oh, it's too bad, Jack, but you shouldn't jump at conclusions like that. I'll say I shouldn't. On the way over to her house, I tore up all my old phone numbers. <laughs> hmm. Now, if I want a date, I'll have to join the Lonesome Club. <laughs> but as I said before, Don, they were awfully sweet. You know, they even wanted me to go along with them and... Pardon me. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. This is Rochester. It is, eh? Oh, are you still mad at me, boy? Yes, Rochester. I'm not talking to you. Goodbye. Hmm. Can't get around me that easy. Now, what's the trouble, Jack? It's a personal matter, Don. I'd rather not discuss it. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, uh, you said something about Clark and Carol wanting you to go along with them. Oh, yes. They needed the best man at their wedding, but I couldn't make it. You see, I'm pretty busy right now. I started making my new picture at Paramount. Paramount? Why, that's where you made your last one. I know, Don. Don't act so surprised. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this is going to be my first legitimate picture. It's called uh, Man About Town. Oh, it's a very clever title. Uh, who's directing it? A fellow by the name of Sandridge, Mark Sandridge. And I'm having a lot of trouble with that guy, too. Jack, you're always having trouble with your directors. What's wrong this time? There's plenty wrong. You see, Don Sandridge directed most of the Astaire Rogers pictures, and he can't get away from that Fred Astaire treatment. It's too much for me. Well, now, what do you mean? Well, he has me jumping over furniture all the time. <laughs> Gee, I'm so tired at night, I can hardly rinse out my socks. <laughs> <laughs> you 
No kidding. Huh? Oh, but I can't imagine that director wanting you to work like Fred Astaire. It must be quite strenuous. You said it. Why, yesterday we shot a scene where I enter an English drawing room to talk to Edward Arno. See, he plays the part of Lord Arlington. Well, I see. Well, anyway, instead of just walking up to him and saying hello, Sandwich made me leap over two divans, a love seat, and the Duchess of Twiffledum. <laughs> My goodness. Did you clear everything? All but the Duchess. <laughs> Every time I tried it, I wound up piggyback. <laughs> I tell you, Don, I'm a wreck. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Leaping Lena. How are you? <laughs> there you are, Don. You see, Mary's been over the studio. She knows. No kidding, Mary. Does Jack really have to do all that jumping? Does he? He's got a kangaroo for a stand-in. <laughs> now, Mary, he's not a real one. That happens to be the man's name, Barney Kangaroo. <laughs> Well, he's got an awful big pocket. <laughs> now, you're just being silly. But you know, Don, there's one thing about this picture that is me. I mean, how agile I am. Why well, leap over that furniture just like Fred Astaire? Who couldn't with bed springs on their shoes? <laughs> well, I had to have some help. And those springs worked out fine. <laughs> You'll get the Academy Award from the Murphy Bed Company. <laughs> oh, I will. Well, let me tell you something, Don. If I don't break a leg, I think this is going to be my best picture. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Jack. Uh, who's going to be in it besides yourself? Well, there's Dorothy Lamour, Edward Arnold, Benny Barnes, E.E. E. Clive, 500 extras, and Phil Harris. <laughs> By the way, uh, where is Phil? Oh, he'll be here in a little while. No kidding, Jack. Is Phil really going to be in your picture? Yes, I got him a small part. He also hangs up my clothes and sees that they're pressed, you know. <laughs> That'll keep him busy. Those big love scenes with Dorothy Lamour will keep him busy, too. <laughs> Listen, Mary, uh, Phil may hold Dorothy in his arms, but her heart belongs to Benny. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Say, Mary, how is Phil of the picture? Is he a good actor? I think he's going to be great in it. Great? What a show-off. Somebody told him he had beautiful hips, and he keeps backing into the camera. <laughs> He looks like a crawfish with a Marcel. <laughs> now, let's forget the picture. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hiya, Jack. Say, your shirt tail's sticking out. It is? Where? April Fool! <laughs> Boy, did you fall for that one. Kenny, in the first place, yesterday was April Fool's Day, and in the second place, you didn't fool me because my shirt tail is out. Is that your shirt? I thought it was a Chinese newspaper. <laughs> well, it has been to the laundry a lot. Kenny, I bet you were some caught up yesterday fooling everybody and carrying on like mad, huh? I'll say. Gee, I sure pulled a good April Fool gag on my girl. She falls for anything. What'd you do, Kenny? Well, I called her up and I said, uh, this is Robert Taylor speaking. Will you marry me? That's cute. What'd your girl say? She said, yes, just as soon as I get rid of that cluck I'm going with. <laughs> well, you certainly fooled her, all right. You ought to hear the gag I pulled on my boss, Mervyn Leroy. I sent him a bomb. Yahoo! You sent him a bomb? Did he get it? Oh, I think so. I can't find him. Why, Kenny, you're just making that up because I saw Mervyn Leroy on the street this afternoon. All of them? Yes, all of them. Now, let's forget about April Fool's Day because it's over and done with. How about singing your song? Okay, I'm ready. Hold it a minute, Kenny. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Uh, take it, Mary. Here you are, boy. Here's a tip for you. A tip? Yes. I ho, nickel. <laughs> Fresh guy. Don't believe him, folks. It was a quarter. Must be cheap material. It shrunk. Never mind that. Who's the wire from? Oh, look, Jack. It's from Fred Allen. Oh, that Mongolian? What's he got to say? Uh, dear Screwball. Hmm. Understand you are starting a new picture called Man About Town. If you're the man, get out of town before it's released, my dear. <laughs> Oh, he would have to put his two cents in. <laughs> That's a hot one. Sing your song, Kenny, or I'll put you back in the trunk. <laughs> that Allen's going too far. It wasn't on the island of Capri. It wasn't on the beach at Barca nor at a perfume counter in Paris that we met. And yet, something in the air was continental. There were moonbeams caressing the sand. 
I was feeling young and sentimental At a little cross end Too gallantly I handed you the mustard Then you curtsied, I kissed your hand Inwardly my heart was getting flustered At a little hot dog stand The bubbles in our soda pop just hit us like champagne I guess that we had five or six From somewhere in the distance came a beneath we pray Or was my fancy playing free Then and there the spark of love ignited It was real and a meeting was grand To our wedding breakfast you're invited At a little hot dog stand There were moonbeams caressing the sand At a little hot dog stand Gallantly I handed you the mother Then you curtsied and I kissed your hand At a little hot dog stand The bubbles in our soda pop just hit us like champagne I guess it's in the five or six From somewhere in the distance came a beanie's refrain Or was my fancy playing trick? Then and there the spark of love ignited It was real and the feeling was grand To our wedding breakfast door invited At a little hot dog stand There we go. That was a little old hot dog stand sung by Kenny Baker. And very good, Kenny. I enjoyed it immensely. You're not the only one, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> Modest little devil. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a rare treat in store for you. Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another... Hmm, I can't get over that wire from Alan. You know, Don, that guy's got a lot of nerve taking up my time with those cheap gags of his. Oh, I agree with you, Jack. Did you hear him Wednesday night? Yes, him and that Maxwell Strauss stuff. He's about as clever as Simple Simon. Well, I think it's marvelous the way Fred makes up his gags as he goes along. Oh, you do, eh? Yes, he certainly knows how to ad lib. Ad lib? Sure he ad libs. He has to. He can't read a script. <laughs> Why, do you know, Don, he has nothing in his library but life, look, and click. <laughs> I happen to know. Well, Jack, if Alan can't read, how does he order food from a menu in a restaurant? He goes to a cafeteria where he can point. <laughs> He took up juggling just so he wouldn't drop a tray. <laughs> anyway, getting back to our program, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another... Pardon me. Hello? Hello, oh, Mr. Bennett, this is me again. Rochester Van Jones, I'm not talking to you. You mean I'm still on the blacklist? Certainly. <laughs> uh, goodbye. What's hmm. the matter with you and Rochester, Jack? Oh, it's nothing, Don. Forget it. I know. Quiet. Uh, where were we, Don? Well, uh, you started to tell the folks about my play. Oh, yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous short playlists, which are bringing him nearer and nearer to the Pulitzer Prize. Take it, Wilson. The scene is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Luke Miller, who live in a cab in the just part of the Mojave Desert. They are just finishing their evening meal. Music, please. <laughs> Well, Tess, I thought our dinner tonight was excellent, especially that tempting and delicious jello. You're right, Luke. It was worth going 50 miles to the nearest grocer to get it. I'll say it was. Hmm, who can that be? We haven't had a visitor in this forsaken spot in over three years. Luke, I told you we should have built this out of camp on a highway. <laughs> oh, they'll put a road through here one of these days. Come in. Oh, I'm starving. Look, look, Luke, it's a man. Yes, yes, Tess, it is. Let's carry him over to this chair. Where am I? Take it easy, young fellow. 
What seems to be the trouble? I'm a prospector, and for three weeks now I've been lost in the desert without food or drink. I'm starving, I tell you. Starving, starving. Be calm, my boy. We'll take care of you. Yes, I'll fix you a nice hot dish of beef stew. No, thank you. I'm a vegetarian. Oh, then how about a nice cucumber salad? Sorry, old man. I like cucumbers, but they don't like me. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I'm so weak. I'm starving, I tell you. Starving, starving. Be patient. We'll think of something, stranger. Say, would you like a piece of homemade chocolate cake? With nuts in it? Yes. Pecans or walnuts? <laughs> Walnut. No, thank you. <laughs> well, good heavens, man, you gotta eat something. Isn't there anything you'd like? Yes. Have you any jello? Jello? I'm sorry, old man. We had some, but we ate every bit of it. But I'm gonna make it again tomorrow. Okay, I'll be back. So long. <laughs> so long, stranger. I'm starving, I tell you. Starving, starving. <laughs> What are the comments of office? That little drama, folks, was written by our own Don Wilson. And, Don, I'll have to admit that you're a fat, no coward. <laughs> of all your plays, that's the best one yet. Well, don't give me all the credit, Jack. That was a true story. I believe you. You know, one of these days, Don, you ought to... Hey, Jack, look who just came in. Oh, yes, our new movie star. Hello, Mr. Harris. You're a little late, aren't you? I am a bit tardy, but by the time I selected my wardrobe and had my bath, time just fizzled away. <laughs> well, I can imagine. <laughs> Listen, Phil, because you're in the movies now is no excuse for being late. Well, I was home studying my part. I've got a big day before the camera tomorrow. Oh, you have? Hey, Phil, can I have your autograph? Later, son. <laughs> what a ham. I want to tell you something, Phil. I saw a, street, a screen test. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I saw a screen test of you the other day, and believe me, it broke my heart. Was it that good? I'm talking to Phil. And another thing, Phil, while you're working in my picture, I don't want you to go around giving all the girls at Paramount your phone number. My phone number? Yes, phone number. I saw you with that blonde in front of the commissary the other day. Now, wait a minute, Jack. She just asked me what time it was, and I told her. Well, she must have a poor memory. She wrote it down. <laughs> I can't see how you ever got into a suave, sophisticated picture like this one. You should talk. You used to be a comedian in a burlesque show. Sliding Sam Benny. <laughs> now, that's what I call greening it up. Mary, have I ever been in a burlesque show? Only as a customer. There you are. <laughs> I just go in there once to get my father. <laughs> He's nearsighted and thought it was grand opera. Who is he waiting in the alley for, Gallicurchy? I didn't inquire. <laughs> and now, Phil, if you can forget you're a movie star for a couple of minutes, how about a band number? Okay, Jackson. The boys and myself are going to play a popular little ditty entitled... <laughs> Never mind the bread, Sonny. Pop will be home with a bun. <laughs> now, Phil, stop with those epigrams. Now, what are you going to play? All right. Mary and I have been rehearsing that new song, I Go For That, and we're going to sing it to each other. Oh, well, that's a novelty. Say, Mary, you're going to sing with Phil, eh? Uh-huh. That ought to be cute. Well, that's better not become a habit. <laughs> Kenny, don't be so jealous. You're not the only singer in the world. Well, I'm the object of my affection. <laughs> Never mind that. Go ahead, Phil and Mary. Let's hear what you've cooked up. Okay. okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Is your real name Maxwell Stroud? No, it isn't. I'm not Maxwell Stroud. Don't lie to me, Daddy. Come right home. <laughs> Get out of here. What a pest. I wonder if I could catch him on fly paper.
the way you walk that silly talk, I go for that. You dizzy folks, your corny jokes, I go for that. Your kiss just misses, your dancing is rough. But you love that stuff, I guess you don't get around enough. Your crazy poems, your letters from home, I go for that. And furthermore, I just adore your kinky hair, that puffy stare. To Mr. Cupid, I take off my hat. You can't account for a silly face of all the girls you could have chased. I looked at you and who I go for that. You know, Mary, we'll have a home, a private phone. I go for that. Yeah, not only that, you'll have a ring, a pretty thing. I go for that. But your salary misses, so cut off that stuff. You mean the going will be rough. I guess you just don't make enough. But Jell-O's fine, and I'm in line to get more dough. I heard that crack. You'll get the sack, you corny Joe from the Wilshire Ball. <laughs> now, Mr. Benny, you take that right back. Now, look, at boys, you mustn't fight. You're breaking up my wedding night. He'd better not, because do I go for that. <laughs> That was I Go For That, played by the orchestra with a special vocal chorus by Jeanette McLivingston and Nelson Harris. <laughs> the Nightingales of the Jell-O program. If you want the real low, don't ask me. <laughs> Kenny, I don't recall anybody asking you. Now, keep still. More darn singers on this program. Don't be surprised if I'm not here next Sunday. <laughs> You'll be here next Sunday and like it. Well, I'll be here, but I won't sing. You'll sing, too. Now, drop it. And now, folks... I won't sing good. <laughs> and you'll sing good. Not very. Hand it. <laughs> and now, folks, going from juvenile temperament to our feature attraction, tonight we are going to present... Pardon me, if that's Rochester again, I'll... Hello? Hello, boss, are you still looking down on me with scorn? <laughs> Rochester, I want you to stop with these telephone calls. Do you hear me? Well, boss, I said I was sorry. Rochester, what you did to me, only time will heal. <laughs> Goodbye. Hmm. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to present... What's all this mystery, Jack? What are you mad at Rochester for? Don, it concerns only him and me. Oh, why don't you tell him, Jack? Yes, what did he do? Very well, Don. Rochester hocked my polar bear. <laughs> That's what he did. He what? You heard me. He pawned Carmichael for $30. Of all the low tricks. For heaven's sake, Jack, didn't you know the bear was missing? Of course I did, but Rochester told me he was playing the Orpheum. <laughs> then when I was downtown last night, I happened to walk by a pawn shop, and there was Carmichael hanging in the window, right next to a slide trombone. <laughs> <laughs> but, Jack, how'd you know it was your bear? He was wearing my new wristwatch. John Roger, he could have got $12 on that alone. I know. <laughs> Well, we hadn't heard the last of this. Oh, well, let's get back to our play. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to present a new and original comedy drama entitled Topper Takes an Aspirin. He's taken everything else. <laughs> now, in this vehicle, I will naturally play the part of Topper, while Mary... Oh, more interruptions. Come in. What are you... Well, I'll be darned. Hey, fellas, look who's here. Hello, Stranger. Slap him up. I slap him up. Well, 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 this is indeed a surprise. It's good to see you again, Slapperman. And I'm happy to see you too, Jackie boy. Well, well look, everybody's here. It's like old times. Hello, Mary. Hello, Slap. My, my, you're getting prettier every day. Thanks. How's your wife? Vice versa. 
Ah, oh, good old sweat. Doggone, it's good to see you again. And Kenny and Phil, believe me, you're a sight for sore feet. <laughs> Hello, Slapperman. Glad to see you, Slap. And Don Wilson, my, my, tell me, were you always so big or don't I remember? <laughs> well, Slap, to tell you the truth, I did put on a pound here and there. Here, I don't mind, but there, it's unbecoming. Ha, <laughs> 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 same old Slap. Well, I haven't seen you in over a year. What have you been doing with yourself? I've been all over the country, north, south, east, and uptown. I was playing in vaudeville. In vaudeville? Uh, what kind of an act did you do? I was a magician. Oh, a magician? Oh. Were you a good one? Sensational. You should see me pull the lining out of the hat. Say, hey, that's some trick. Uh, well, what are you doing out here in California, Schlepp? On a vacation? No, I'm in business here. I opened up a little nightclub. Schlepperman's Hawaii, Haciente. Uh, Look, if you're here. Uh. Well, I'll sure be out there to see you. Tell me, Slep, have you got a floor show? Have I got a floor show? Mm. My son Tinkus plays the drums. I play the ukulele. Oh. And for a feature, my wife wriggles. <laughs> Say, that sounds great. You know, I'd like to drop in and see your wife do the hula. Okay, if you're passing by, but don't make it a special trip, please. <laughs> oh, she can't be that bad. Well, I wish you a lot of luck in your new place, and we'll be over to see you very soon. Thank you, Well, I got to travel along now. Aloha, everybody. So long, Slap. Good afternoon, Slap. So long, Slap. I want to go back to my little dress sack on the La and on Third Street around the corner. <laughs> Well, it's sure good seeing Schlepperman again. He's a nice little fellow. Well, kids, it's getting kind of late now. I don't think we'll have time to do our play. So how about saving it for next week? It's very long, and if that's who I think it is, he's in for a good bawling out. Hello? Hello, Hello boss. boss. This is your bad boy, Jogan. <laughs> Rochester, I told you before, I'm not making up with you until you unhock that polar bear. So goodbye. Goodbye. Wait a minute, boss. That's what I called you up about. I got called out of the pawn shop. He's back in the house. Oh, well, that's more like it. Now, don't you ever do a thing like that again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute. I just thought of something. Where did you get the $30 to get Carmichael out of the pawn shop? I thought you weren't speaking to me. <laughs> Rochester, where did you get that $30? The what? The $30, where did you get it? It could have been a legacy, you know. <laughs> It could have, but it wasn't. Now, for the last time, where did you get the $30? I sold my AT&T. Rochester, you never had a share of stock in your life. Now, if you don't tell me where you got that $30, you're fired. Okay, boss. Your violin is now hanging where Carmichael was. <laughs> oh, my... Rochester, did you pawn my slight of variant? That ain't what the man said. So long, boss. Rochester, Rochester, can you match that fellas? He pawned my violin. Hooray! Hooray! Here's something every woman knows, that her family is always eager for something new and different for dessert. It's not always easy to find, though, and that's why every week we try to bring you some new ideas. Tonight's specialty is a delicious combination called Jell-O Plum Mold. It's a shimmering mold of rich red cherry jello with canned blue plums, the big juicy kind. It's easy to make, too, and here's how. Dissolve one package of cherry jello in one pint of hot water and chill until slightly thickened. Then fold in one cup of canned blue plums. Mold until firm and, well, there you are. Quick, easy, and temptingly good. For cherry jello brings you that incomparable, extra-rich flavor, as appetizing as fresh, ripe fruit. It tastes just grand combined with the succulent goodness of juicy plums, so try this new dessert tomorrow. Ask your grocer for cherry jello and surprise the family with a jello plum mold. We're a little late, so good night, folks. Jakey, help, help!